Welcome to Instigators of Change, a Coastal Ventures podcast where we take a look at innovative ideas, the people who come up with them, and those who invest in them. I'm Kara Miller, and this week, a journey into why venture capital is where it is and what it is. Uh, the first thing you might learn about finance in business school is that to value an asset, you discount the future cash flow and you work out a price earnings ratio. Well, I mean, there's no earnings in an early stage startup, which is just two legged mammals walking into your office with a dream. First, though, a little story that, as you'll discover, is ultimately a story of venture capital. So I don't know if you've heard the one about the NBA player who walks out of a movie theater, but here it goes. Imagine you're in a movie theater, you're about to see a movie, and you take a look around at the men in the movie theater, and you notice something interesting about them. Five foot ten is the average height, and nearly everybody is within three inches of that, so between five seven and six one. Sebastian Malaby is a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a longtime financial journalist. And when you meet an NBA star and they're six foot ten, that is pretty unusual and also sufficiently unusual that if you were thinking about a movie theater and you had a packed movie theater and the one NBA star gets bored of the movie and walks out, the height of the residual men on average won't really change because one person who's an outlier doesn't change it. Right. So you've got this normal distribution in the movie theater, the kind of bell curve that you see a lot in science and economics, where all the men, or almost all the men, are clustered in height around this average, which is 5'10". The NBA player is way taller, but when he leaves, the average height of, let's say, the 99 guys he left behind, that doesn't really change. One super tall guy cannot meaningfully move the needle. That is a normal distribution. But Malaby was not interested in normal distributions. Instead, he set out to write a book about something else, a power law distribution. If you think of wealth distribution in the population, and you imagine the movie theater, but the person at the back is not an NBA star, it's uh, Jeff Bezos, it's a very wealthy person. If Jeff Bezos walks out of the movie because it's boring, the average wealth of the residual men is going to plummet. Because that's not a normal distribution, right? You've got the extreme observations being both more common when it comes to wealth and way, way bigger, uh, way, way further from the average. And I did the calculations here. Let's say 100 men in the movie theater are all worth, on average, $500,000. Now, let's say 99 of them are worth $500,000 and one is Jeff Bezos. What will the new average worth of the men in the movie theater be? About $1.8 billion. That's each person's new worth. Which is part of the reason that Malaby was so fascinated by this idea of the power law. It's a law that's everywhere in venture capital. Fewer than 1% of companies that get started every year get venture finance in the United States. But that tiny number of VC-backed companies accounts for 75% of the market cap created basically over the last quarter century. So this tiny amount of venture capital generates three quarters of the market cap. I, I, I mean, that's a phenomenal ratio. Malaby is the author of the new book, The Power Law, Venture Capital and the Making of the New Future, in which he talks about how venture capital is changing the world, why it struggles to be diverse, how it's grappling with China, why VCs worry there's a bubble, and whether founders are wielding way too much power right now. But first, Malaby says, this is a strange industry because it mostly works on breadcrumbs of information, unlike other areas of finance. It's reshaping the stuff we do and eat and think about, and it's growing in a few ways. It's spreading geographically, right? So, you know, you've now got a big venture capital ecosystem in China, and it's growing in India and Southeast Asia and Europe. It's quite big in Israel, starting to take off in Latin America. It's not just Silicon Valley in the U.S. It's now spread to Miami and uh, Austin, Texas, and so forth. So that's one-dimensional, geographical. Then there's the spread along the life cycle of the company uh, because companies are going public way later than they used to. If you think back to the late 90s, Amazon went public when it hit a valuation of below $500 million. And now 
multi-billion dollar unicorns, you know, Stripe is worth like 95 billion. That's becoming more and more prevalent. So what that means is that companies are staying in the hands of venture capitalists. Venture capitalists are writing these bigger checks of 100, 200 million. And so that's the second dimension of expansion. And then the third one is the scope of different industries that are getting disrupted by venture is growing. You know, we used to be basically talking about, you know, the internet and IT, but increasingly software has just spread into everything. So whether it's the hotel business with Airbnb, whether it's the food business with Impossible Foods making a, you know, a meat-free hamburger, it could be retail like Warby Parker upending the way people buy spectacles. You know, pretty much anything can be disrupted by software. And so that's the third dimension of growth. And that's why if you put those three dimensions together, people are rightly focused on venture capital more than they used to be. When you put all that together, do you worry there's a bubble or that people have gotten in who can't handle the kind of ice water in the veins, stomach churning ride that it is? I do. I mean, I think that the success of venture capital uh, has drawn in imitators. Sometimes those imitators are just sort of rich individuals who want to have a shot at uh, the excitement of venture investing, because when it goes right, it really goes right in a big way. So you see, you know, some disasters like uh, Theranos, famously the fake blood testing company, you know, had money from the Walton family of Walmart fame. It had money from Rupert Murdoch. Uh, these are people who are not really tech investors. Then you've got newcomers who are, who are financial investors by profession, but they're not really used to uh, tech investing and they may have multiple motives. So one of the things that went wrong with the real estate company WeWork was that it had a lot of investment from banks like JP Morgan. And I think when you look at it, JP Morgan's interest in WeWork wasn't just that it thought it would buy equity and the equity would do terrifically well. That's like a normal venture investment calculation. On top of that, JP Morgan was hoping to lend money to the company. It was hoping to lend money to Adam Newman, the founder of the company, on a personal basis. It was opening, you know, crucially to underwrite the initial public offering because that's a very lucrative mandate to get. So when you get investors of that sort who have multiple incentives to invest, they're not necessarily focused on the return on the investment per se. And that creates kind of, you know, a blurring of motivation and objective that causes trouble. Um, you spoke to a lot of venture capitalists for this. Um, and and venture capitals are very different across the spectrum. Did you feel like the ones who had were seasoned, had really been around, who understood how this thing worked, um, did you feel like they had something in common? I think if you compare venture capitalists to another group that I've written about in the past, namely hedge fund managers, there is okay. a very distinct difference, right? I mean, hedge fund managers are making intellectual calls kind of abstractly on on valuations of stocks and of bonds and currencies and so forth. And it's quite a purely analytic process, very numbers driven. And so the kind of character type you get is often sort of introverted. On the other hand, venture capital is to a large extent about networking. It's about making and taking introductions. It's about being in the flow of ideas and people and money that are whirling around looking for the best purpose to be put to. And so a good venture capitalist will get up in the morning and have breakfast with one person and then have 14 cups of coffee with different people before they go to bed. <laughs> or, or, or maybe matcha tea or smoothie or something. But you know what I mean? There'll be a ton of meetings because you're looking for the next founder you might invest in. You're meeting with a founder you invested in three months ago. You're maybe helping to recruit the first five engineers for a startup that you backed uh, a couple of months back, you're perhaps looking for the uh, customer for your startup because that's another thing the venture capitalists do. They put fledgling companies together with their first customers if it's an enterprise-facing uh, startup. So it's all about circulating and being in the in the ecosystem. And I think you've got to have a decent amount of emotional intelligence and charisma and communication skills, persuasiveness. All of those things play on top of analytic intelligence. 
Well, you know, I think about um, a person who I, uh, you know, once did a segment on um, Jim Simons at um, at Renaissance, a, a real, real big hedge fund. And one of the things that strikes me, too, that's different is that uh, there's a real reliance on computers and data. I mean, obviously, it's different for different hedge fund managers, but that computers help you predict. Whereas if you're a venture capitalist and you're seeing something, you know, on on in in the early days and they're telling you what things are going to be like in 10 years, like there's no computer program you can plug that into. Exactly. I mean, a big thing about venture capital, which is what made me fascinated right at the beginning when I began researching my book, is that it is so different to other types of investing. And the big point that you just made, that it's non-quantitative, basically. Right. Uh, the first thing you might learn about finance in business school is that to value an asset, you discount the future cash flow and you work out a price earnings ratio. Well, I mean, there's no earnings in an early stage startup, which is just two-legged mammals walking into your office with a dream. <laughs> I don't always think of it that way, but yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you know, as I said, you talked to a lot of VCs. One of them was uh, Peter Thiel, who makes headlines for all sorts of reasons. But but you have a great quote from him, um, and it is, we could cure cancer, dementia, and all the diseases of age and metabolic decay. We can invent faster ways to travel from place to place over the surface of the planet. We can even learn how to escape it entirely and settle entirely new frontiers. That's obviously a lot to process. Uh, but just starting with the first bit of evading like the ravages of old age, this is a man, this is a sector, a whole group of people with very lofty goals. <laughs> yeah. So if you take that literally, it's sort of crazy, right? It's so ambitious that it, it sounds nuts. But I think if you look at the method behind the madness, it becomes more interesting. Uh, and what I mean by that is that in a world where you have this power law pattern of returns. There is no viable strategy for a venture capitalist investing in things that are sort of quite good because the distribution is such that, you know, most things are going to go nowhere and then a few are going to do 10x, 20x, 30x your money and those are going to be really disruptive ideas. And so you've kind of got to reach for the flying car type of idea. I mean, that's a caricature extreme, but let's take other ideas. What about the notion that, a geneticist by profession would invent a new kind of uh, meat that will taste exactly like meat, but actually has no meat in it. And when you put it on the barbecue, it'll sizzle and make a smell uh, like a proper hamburger. Hmm. That's the idea behind Impossible Foods, which is now a real company heading towards an IPO. And, uh, you know, it was a success. What about the idea that you're going to upend the entire hotel business based on a strategy where people will take total strangers <laughs> right, 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 to sleep on their couches. Yeah, that's going to work. Yeah. Well, it did that work. That should work, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that, you know, flying cars is a kind of caricature, but, you know, pushing for extreme disruption is, in fact, what venture capitalists do, and they do it rather successfully. I want to go sort of back in time for a minute to understand how we got where we are. Um, one of the things you write about is that in the 1950s, when you find some of the first examples of what we might call venture capital um, in the tech space, the idea of convincing individuals or banks to fund even like the very best scientists, even with pretty proven technologies, that was a huge uphill climb in a way that I think is probably hard to imagine right now. Yeah, that's right. So when the famous traitorous eight left Shockley Semiconductor in 1957, because they didn't like the boss, Shockley was a Nobel Prize winner, but he was a terrible guy to work for. Their idea was that they should join as a team of eight scientists and work for another company, because the notion of raising their own money and having their own venture was too radical. And it was the, the financier, Arthur Rock, who became the father of West Coast Venture Capital, who put it to them that this was what they could do, that they could have their own company and own a piece of it and get the fruits of their own brilliance. Um, why do you think the Bay Area, you write about this in a very interesting way, but why did the Bay Area emerge as so powerful um, 
And, you know, I'll just say one of the interesting things I found is that a lot of the explanations people have told me for this over time, you sort of take a swipe at and you're like, yeah, that doesn't really make any sense. Yeah, well, so rather like you, I guess, I mean, I was told at the beginning of my research project that, you know, Silicon Valley is really Stanford Valley, right? It's because Stanford's such an amazing place. And the reality is that in the 1960s and even 70s, when uh, Silicon Valley got going, Stanford was clearly less strong in engineering than MIT. And then people say, well, there was Berkeley. Okay, but, you know, Harvard ain't too bad. And in fact, was... <laughs> a, so, so if you put Harvard and MIT together in Boston, it was clearly a stronger academic magnet than Stanford plus Berkeley. Then people say, all right, so it's not that. It's the defense contracts. There's a whole sort of narrative about, you know, the government wanted to buy defense equipment, which requires semiconductors. And the, this meant contracts came to Silicon Valley. Now, that's not persuasive either. Why? Because more defense contracts went to the Boston area. Famously, you know, Lincoln Labs was this military affiliated laboratory with links to MIT. And out of that came a bunch of companies, Raytheon being a good example of a defense major that came out of that connection. And the military industrial complex was really about that MIT, Boston, Washington axis. And to the extent that California was a player, it was more really Southern California with aerospace. So the defense contracts thing is is not persuasive either. And then people say, well, all right, California had hippies. And you go, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it had a sort of contrarian, you know, do your own thing, anti-materialist, collaborative vibe. And that's why people were willing to to do startups and take risks and and all that. But I think it's clear that when you look at that story I just mentioned about the traitorous eight finding Fairchild Semiconductor having spun out of Shockley, the impetus came not from the uh, scientists, it came from the financier who said, you can start your own company, I'll raise the money for you. And time and again, as I went through these narratives of early startups that became a big deal in Silicon Valley and really built the early valley, it was the finance that underpinned the risk that made people willing to take risk. It's not that people sniffed the air in Silicon Valley and thought, oh, now I am, you know, I have a big risk appetite because there's something special out here. No, it was because VCs were willing to say, it's not actually risky because I'll give you the money to do this. What's your sense from outside the Valley, outside those centers of venture capital, and certainly like New York and Boston are part of that, London is part of that, what do average people, even people thinking up ideas, you know, college kids thinking up ideas for companies, what does the outside world tend to, what's the image they have of venture capital? I think there's a suspicion of finance generally in society. Um, people don't like bankers. They don't really like hedge fund managers. They don't really like venture capitalists. Venture capitalists maybe had a slight pass for a while because People didn't quite know who they were, <laughs> but now they've become more prominent. I think there's a suspicion that they sort of show up and cream the profits off startups. They don't really do much to contribute to the startups. And that's wrong on two dimensions. It's wrong because, first of all, society has a limited amount of uh, resources to put into startups. That's both the money and also the people. So somebody has to choose which startup ideas deserve the resources to have a shot at taking off. And so the VCs are steering the money and then with that, the talented people that get hired with that money. So that's a useful function in managing resources. And I think, you know, VCs are responsible for doing that. And then secondly, after the investment, VCs often mentor the startup founders and help them. Starting a, a startup is super hard work. It's heads down hard work. And having an investor behind you who understands the map and the territory into which your startup will fit and to provide kind of just a sort of coaching and mentoring and solidarity function, that's pretty important. Uh, you quote uh, Bill Gurley, um, who says basically the vast majority of entrepreneurs, like to your point, should not take venture capital. This is a this is like for a subset of people Um do you think people have a sense of like, who are those people that need the VC world and other people don't? 
Well, the answer to who needs it is essentially those who would like to be really ambitious about their startups, grow them really fast, understanding that that's going to be stressful personally, and it's also going to involve risk. Because when you spend a lot of money in a hurry on hiring your co-workers and scaling up fast and and so on, you know, you, you might get it wrong and then you might fail. And once you've failed, you're quite likely to do a Monday morning quarterback and say, gee, if I'd gone a bit slower, been a bit more thoughtful and deliberate and more careful, maybe I wouldn't have blown up and maybe the VC mm-hmm. caused me to blow up. But as, as another you know, VC investor said, uh, Josh Kopperman, I sell rocket fuel and not everybody wants to build a rocket. Um, and right, I, said, right, 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 right. I, I think entrepreneurs have to decide for themselves if they're up for the rocket. So I want to talk a little bit about what the road ahead looks like. Give me a sense from talking to different VCs, how they see things right now and like what kind of change do you think they are looking for in the technology that shapes how we live? I think one rough consensus is that software has dominated the most exciting investments for the last 20 years. And that's not necessarily going to be the case going forward, that other things, what gets called hard tech or deep tech, but also categories like, you know, food tech, potentially, you know, stuff around nuclear power, the whole clean tech area, including electric vehicles and batteries for electric vehicles. All of these things, no doubt, include software components, but they're not restricted to software. So I think that's broad brush one type of Hmm. view of the future. Of course, there's a debate about what the metaverse will wind up meaning. And Andreessen Horowitz is an example of a VC company that has prominently bet a lot on the whole area of crypto slash uh, blockchain slash metaverse. And one has to describe it in those slightly loose terms because this is a sort of (laughs) project that's in the process of being discovered. And there are other VCs who would, just stay clear of it and say, you know, I might be interested in little pieces of that. But whilst I might think that, for example, virtual reality headsets will be a real thing, I'm not buying into the wider vision. So that's another kind of debate. There's, I think, quite an interesting bifurcation between China and the rest, because the state has obviously waded into the tech sector in China, famously deciding that it doesn't like digital education uh, or sort of online uh, ed tech uh, and has restricted that. And instead it said it does like semiconductors, it does like AI. So it's driving a lot of VC dollars in the direction that it favors. Well, the, my sense with the ed tech thing, to, correct me if I'm wrong, but my sense was that the reason the Chinese government didn't like it wasn't because there's anything intrinsically wrong with ed tech, but because they felt that Chinese parents were being kind of asked to spend essentially too much money on cram courses and certain kinds of prep, and they just felt like that was, it had gotten out of hand. Yeah, I think there was some of that equality, equity motivated reasoning. Another story I heard from a colleague who is Chinese, although she's now been in the US for a long time, and and actually worked at an ed tech startup before she left China. She told me that a big motivation and this is her judgment based on speaking to her friends who are still over there, is that the government doesn't want so many bright young kids to go to the US for university, for college. Hmm. And a lot of these ed tech companies were actually training people to prepare for US college admissions. And that was part of the clampdown too. Yeah. No, it's funny because you also have like stories in the book where People are in China raising money for different companies and different funds and that kind of thing. And like, they'll say, you know, let's have a meeting tomorrow, whatever. And everybody who shows up, though they might be Chinese, has like gone to Stanford, (laughs) which I think is a funny story is like, here you are in the middle of Shanghai. And it's like, yeah, everybody also went to Stanford. Right. And that actually gets to sort of the larger point that, you know, the Chinese digital economy is to an amazing extent created by the Silicon Valley playbook. Uh, led by the venture capitalists who came, you know, in the late 90s and the early 2000s and set up there uh, with the result that, you know, if you ask the question, what's the top VC partnership in Silicon Valley? I think most people tell you it's Sequoia. If you ask the question, what's the top VC partnership in China? 
most people would tell you is Sequoia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there really is this sort of, you know, the, the same secret source was bottled and exported to China. And that's what was the origins of Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, Sina, Sohu, NetEase, all these early Chinese digital companies originated with American venture capital. Well, uh, interestingly, you also say that China's venture capital industry may be counterintuitively, I don't know, counterintuitively to me, perhaps, is more open to women than the U.S. I think the U.S., we think of ourselves as being very into uh, equality, but you say that their VC industry is quite open to women. Yeah. When I went to China and, and spent around 10 days kind of going to talk to VCs, I was struck by how many people who, you know, I was just seeing the people I'd been told were the most interesting, the most successful and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, that list turned out to include quite a lot of women. Uh, maybe it might be 40%, something like that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't quite equal, but it was getting there. And that's definitely different to if you go to Silicon Valley, it's just, that would not be true. So I was struck by that. I think the two leading hypotheses as to why that's the case, one is that, you know, the venture ecosystem in China is really was created around 2005, 2010. And, you know, the one in the US was formed in the 70s. And so that interim of 40 years meant that you were, you know, there'd been more progress and attitudes so that when a new industry was created in China, it was formed with a better set of views on gender inclusion. Another theory, though, is that childcare in China, and this is also true in India and Southeast Asia, it's just cheaper. And so one of the things that tends to hold women back in their careers is that famously in the US, there is not really much of a gender gap in pay before the age of having children. And then it really kicks in in that period of young kids because, you know, childcare is so expensive and the sort of default for the burden of that falls on women much more than men. And that's less of an issue in China because, you know, people who are going to be venture capitalists tend to be able to afford a lot of childcare quite easily. Do you think that venture capitalists here are worried about the rise of venture capital in China as a competitive force? Or do people think, you know, that's OK, I just want to change the world. And I don't in some ways the opportunity to do that in China, America, like I'm agnostic as to where I do this. I don't know, like to what degree is this competitive or collaborative or what? I think if you're an investor, if you're a venture capitalist, then yeah. It's not competitive. It's just like more opportunities. If right. you look at it from the point of view of sort of government policy or your social concerns as an American, you know, are you worried that America will be eclipsed by China? Then clearly it's competitive because, you know, venture capital is basically a facet of national power. If you imagine the United States without various venture backed companies, whether that's, you know, Intel in semiconductors or Microsoft in, in coding. I mean, these are companies that, A, generate enormous amounts of prosperity and value and wealth and patents and scientific cutting edge achievements. But they also generate actual defense products. Uh, right. But I'm less sure about Microsoft, but clearly there are kind of other coding companies like Palantir that specialize in servicing the defense sector. And so... If you think about China without Huawei, the 5G routing company, uh, it would be a less powerful country. So I think clearly from a sort of national competition standpoint, it is competition. I'm going to ask you another question uh, with a different kind of geography in it, which is um, we've been talking about how venture capital is centered in Silicon Valley. Uh, New York and the Boston area also do pretty well in terms of uh, venture capital that they attract. That's not that many places in the U.S. It seems like it would be possible with technology. I mean, I think about the last two years where people are like scattered all over the place doing their jobs and they seem to be doing them OK. Would it be better if venture capital was more distributed geographically? Is that at all happening? Or, you know, we talked about the power a lot at the beginning. Is it just like the winners keep winning kind of situation? It's been that winners keep winning situation for a long time. But there was an anomaly that had grown up by, you know, let's say 10 years ago, where the geography, Silicon Valley, that was creating all this wonderful 
you know, distance communication techniques and, and collaboration methods like Slack or, or what have you, you know, insisted that they had to be physically proximate to each other in order to network and, and create all this value, uh, which sort of didn't make sense, right? I mean, they were creating the products that meant that, that their own premise wasn't true. And so then along comes the pandemic and forces a lot of adaptation. And, you know, it's become a cliche to say digital adoption was accelerated by five years or something. It was accelerated, especially in Silicon Valley. And so now, as you say, you've got people doing startups all over the country and you've got venture capitalists who have moved out of Silicon Valley to Austin or Miami or what have you. And mm. I think it is going to be more dispersed and that would be a good thing. It's just, mm. it's just better for the country to have a more equitable regional balance of where ideas get funded and where they get built. One of your kind of criticisms of the industry is, and this is a quote from you, the venture capital industry is indeed a clique, too white, too male, too Harvard, Stanford, a sector with so much influence on the shape of the future, you write, should take diversity more seriously. Is that happening? I think it's happening, but too slowly. Mm. The last data I've got suggests that of all investment partners in Silicon Valley, uh, only 16% are women and only 3% are black investors. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big underrepresentation, both compared to share of the overall labor force and compared to share of sort of vaguely comparable industries like finance. You know, there are, there are more black bankers at a certain seniority than there are black investors at VC firms. And I think that's a problem because if you're going to invent the future for all of society, you better look a bit more like society. And how do you do that? It is hard, you know, to break out of um, a pattern. How do you do it? Well, I think Kleiner Perkins provides an object lesson in how not to do it. And hopefully people can learn from that. I, I, I describe this lesson, which was that essentially the company had the right instinct, and in particular, the most famous partner there, John Doerr, had a, the right instinct of hiring women and promoting them, but failed to create a sort of enabling atmosphere that protected women from discrimination and harassment once they were there. Because the traditional male culture hadn't been proactively reshaped. You've got to actually go out there and have a collective discussion about, okay, we're hiring women and we need to help them to succeed. You've got to take that second step. And instead of which, they didn't do that. And so the women who were there uh, were, by all accounts, subject to harassment. There was a harassment lawsuit. And most of the women who were hired into Kleiner Perkins wound up doing pretty well, but they did well by leaving and flourishing elsewhere. So I think the lesson from that, and I think you know other partnerships get that now, it's a lesson learned the hard way, is that you you do have to mentor and sort of promote any young partner who joins your partnership and especially take care to do that with somebody who's not from the same either gender or racial group as the majority. And you've got to be really deliberate about how you develop the careers of younger partners. And when I spent time with Sequoia Capital, I was persuaded that they were good at that. You know, they, for example, would, you know, there'd be a new investment at the beginning, when you do an investment with a startup, you've no idea if the startup is really going to succeed or not. So they would do a sort of double act where a seasoned investor would go on the board. And then a younger investor, could be a man, could be a woman, would be the shadow board member. And then if the startup starts to go really well, they can switch positions so that the younger investor gets the credit for the IPO when that happens. But if it fails, the the black mark is on the resume of the experienced investor who can handle it. Um, when you think about the people you talk to, both in venture capital, but also people who know the industry well from outside, uh, what do you think people are most worried about right now? Are there big threats out there, things that kind of eat up people's brain space in a, in a certain way? I think the danger of a bubble is a big thing that's eating up people's brain space. I think that's going to be yeah. felt particularly strongly amongst the growth stage investors who are writing big checks to unicorns because, of course, if you're investing in a unicorn, it's not so far from a potential exit on the stock market. And so if the stock market is crashing, that's very bad. <laughs> Whereas if you're doing early stage investing, 
you're not envisaging an exit for seven, eight, nine, ten years. And so who knows where the stock market will be uh, that far away. And so I don't think it really affects you if you're a Series A kind of early stage investor, but it, it is causing a lot of stress for the later investors. Um, do you feel like the balance of power between founders of companies and venture capitalists has swung in favor of founders? And like, what do you see driving that movement? It's clearly swung in the favor of founders. If you look at it just through the prism of the amount of uh, the company that the investors tend to want to own, it's changed from around 45% of the company that went to the venture capitalist in the 1960s through one third in the 70s and 80s, through as low as a quarter when Google was funded at the end of the 90s, and then to one eighth going to the venture capitalist when you look at Facebook's financing in 2005. I'm talking about the Series A, the early stage uh, investing. So uh, in other words, venture capitalists were providing money and getting less and less and less of the startup they were backing. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that, you know, just more money is flooded into VC, so capital is plentiful, so therefore the cost of it goes down. But another thing is that as the world has shifted towards software, software is something where you can use rather little capital and build a product that reaches a vast number of people very quickly. And so the returns to a company like Google or Facebook or earlier on eBay or Uber, basically another software company, the returns can be really enormous, really fast. And so a VC is willing to accept a smaller share of the equity for the startup funding that the VC provides. Now, is this a bad thing? Well, it's bad, I think, insofar as the entrepreneur, the founder, no longer is being overseen by anybody with the power to really offer firm advice. I, I just think that's unhealthy. I think all human beings are usefully guided. And, you know, we're, we're, none of us are perfect. And if you take a founder like, you know, Travis Kalanick at Uber, who was a brilliant founder at the beginning and then went off the rails sort of morally and practically later on when Uber became a big successful unicorn, that might have been prevented if the startup investor, Bill Gurley, had had the power to force Kalanick to listen. But mm. Kalanick, you know, because of the way that VC had changed, uh, Kalanick had super voting rights in his company. The later stage investors had written, you know, multi-billion dollar checks. I mean, literally, I think in the case of Saudi Arabia, they put in three and a half billion. Wow. And they, they didn't demand any kind of voting rights to compensate for that enormous amount of money. And so Kalanick had no overseers. And the same is true of lots of unicorn uh, founders. And I, I just think that's setting you up for trouble. Hmm. Sebastian Malaby is author of the book, The Power Law, Venture Capital and the Making of the New Future. Sebastian, thanks so much. This is great. Thank you for having me. Sebastian Malaby was formerly on the editorial board of The Washington Post and a contributing editor for The Financial Times. Coming up for us next week on Instigators of Change. We sent from 2020 to 2021, we sent 40 billion more emails. We're meeting 128 <laughs> percent like more than we were. We've doubled the amount of time we're meeting. And remember, subscribe to the show on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, or wherever you find the things that you love to listen to. I'm Kara Miller. Our show is produced by Matt Purdy. We will talk to you next time.